Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Conversations with Tyler. Today I'm talking with Richard Prum of Yale University. I spotted Richard in the field some while ago and classified him as Great American Ornithologist. Richard, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Great to be here. Why is there so much infidelity in Australian birds in particular? <laughs> Well, I, you know, I don't, I don't think that there probably is an extraordinary amount of uh, uh, infidelity in Australian birds. However, there are certainly a number of classic cases of uh, the investigation of, of, uh, of uh, multiple mating in, in, in Australian birds, or the classic case being the, 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 the fairy wrens, uh, which have a very weird social system, including one feature, which is uh, multiple mating. And how well can we explain why fairy wrens are different in their mating practices, right? How much explanatory <laughs> power does ornithology well, we, have we, there? We, 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 need, we, need, we need to talk a little bit about what makes fairy wrens extraordinary in, in, in other ways. Um, fairy wrens uh, live in cooperative groups, uh, extended families that include multiple males and females of reproductive age. And uh, usually a large number of them are the uh, least male offspring of previous years that are hanging around helping mom and dad or uh, some adults raise their, 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 their relatives. Um, this probably because, uh, this probably arises, and it's very common in Australian birds, it probably arises because of uh, very high habitat uh, variability, in particular variability in rainfall. As you see already, thinking about Australia, we think a lot about, you know, that's a drought or not, right? So under those conditions, you never really know whether you're going to have enough resources to, to raise kids. Another feature is that um, the habitat is rich and uh, in some times of the year, and so as a result, they're kind of packed cheek to jowl. So there's no real estate for the kids to go off to. So they stay at home, move into the basement, and help their parents, right, uh, until they can inherit the back 40 or take over a butt off, if you will, into a new territory. So that means there's a lot of reproductive opportunities um, between groups, but the groups are in separate territories. So a lot of uh, what happens in these cooperative species, at, like fairy wrens, as people found out, is that the females mate multiply. Um, and that is they can uh, mate with other members of the, of the group besides the, 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 the mature or most dominant male, or uh, they can mate with other males uh, in other groups. And is it variability of rainfall that makes Australian birds weirder? Um, well, there are two th cool things about it. One is that, yes, and, and people have associated uh, cooperative breeding, this, this special variation in the avian family life where you get a cooperative uh, behavior among reproductive age individuals with uh, unpredictable rainfall. So that's a general phenomenon. You find it a lot in different parts of the world. And how does the equilibrium uh, but, oh, but work there? So the rain, it, rainfall is unpredictable, and, and then what happens? Solve for the yeah. equilibrium, so to speak. Yeah, sure, sure. So, <laughs> so, uh, so uh, uh, rainfall is unpredictable, uh, and 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 also the other combination is uh, the habitat is is saturated, right? So there aren't a lot of places to go. So what that means is that it's often more helpful or more useful for for uh, for uh, individuals to delay dispersal and until their reproductive age, and then they're hanging out, and then of course they do work. And why, what they, how they benefit is is could be both uh, helping their relatives, kin selection, or that they uh, they could be gaining experience, uh, you know, direct benefits like uh, learning how to raise a family before they get a chance to do their own. Is it the case that birds are more modular in construction than mammals? For instance, they don't seem to use their wings and legs so much in concert the way mammals might. Or is that not true? Well, the, the, uh, that's a really cool thing. Uh, actually, if you go back to the gait of a, of a crocodile or any tetrapod, uh, the front legs and the hind legs were really coupled, right? And, you, you know, uh, you have to do that well. Uh, but going back, probably in the very long bipedal uh, theropod dinosaurs, long history of bipedality in theropod dinosaurs, those things had to be uncoupled. And it required a lot of rewiring, both of the motor movement, the, the brain, uh, the muscles, et cetera. So uh, that's ancient in, in the lineage of birds. Uh, think of T. rex with its tiny little uh, uh, forelimbs, uh, very decoupled. Uh, and then what birds have done in flight is actually to couple 
the fore limbs with the tail uh, in flight. So we have a, a part of the axial skeleton, right, which now becomes in a way related to the flight apparatus, which is the, which are the fore limbs, right, the front, the the, the wings. Um, so that's a lot of like it basically turns out to be deep bino, deep dino biology that uh, that birds are just uh, taking advantage of in flight. Here's a very stupid question: the intermediate steps towards the evolution of flight. Why are they efficient? So I go through life. Let's say I didn't have a car. I, I've never woken up and said, gee, I, I would love to glide today, right? <laughs> Gliding serves no purpose for me. So how is it we get to flight in between, right? Why did that persist? Yeah, deep, you know, deep controversy there. You could, you could, there are lots of careers that have been uh, uh, thrown on the, on the pyre of, <laughs> of avian flight origins. <laughs> but uh, but in, in detail, um, uh, there are two theories. One is uh, the ground up cursorial theory, that somehow you're running and you're running fast enough and you start with maybe uh, um, uh, movements that help you manipulate uh, as you run and then finally take off off the, uh, off the ground. And the other is the arboreal theory or the trees down, that you start with gliding and control movements uh, of gliding and then, and then eventually to, to, to powered flight. Um, those folks have been warring at it for, you know, well, almost a century, but really, really going at it for the last uh, few decades. Uh, and so uh, where does this sit now? Uh, the interesting thing is that the, uh, it used to be that the origin of, 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 uh, of, uh, of birds uh, was like a, uh, a, a menu where you had, you know, th column A or column B. And column A was, you know, birds are not related to dinosaurs. Uh, feathers evolved for flight and, and flight evolved from the trees down. And then the opposite was birds are dinosaurs in column B. Birds are dinosaurs. Uh, feathers evolved from, uh, for thermal regulation or for something other than flight. And that feather, uh, flight arrived from the ground or flight uh, arose or evolved from the ground. And it turns out that uh, the dino people were correct. Feathers did not evolve for flight and birds are dinosaurs. But uh, it turns out that column A was actually right about uh, flight. Uh, flight most likely evolved from the trees down, and there's a whole bunch of reasons why, uh, starting with gliding like a flying squirrel and then controlling your gliding and then using those controlled movements to create a, a flight choke. But flying squirrels um, are not that plentiful, right? They're not taking well, over the world. They don't seem oh, to do that well. Yeah, they're sh they sure as how are taking over Borneo. I can tell you. Uh, I don't know if you've been, but you go into into the uh, into uh, Southeast Asia. There are there are uh, forests where uh, there are incredibly diverse uh, uh, gliding mammals of uh, multiple families. Right. So so uh, that's probably because the forest is made mostly of dipterocarps, which look like really 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 high broccoli. You know, thirty meters high. Uh, and so there's a lot of space. And why are they flying or why are they gliding? Well, to get away from predators, or even uh, ultimately they get good enough at it that they can use it to disperse from tree to tree. So the idea is that that's that's how that's how it started. And of course, maybe one of the reasons why why uh, flying squirrels haven't taken over the world is because they never got to powered flight like like birds did, uh, and uh, which obviously is going a, a lot further. Now, according to Jennifer Ackerman, duetting of song occurs in about 16% of bird species. How well can we explain the cross-sectional variation there? Um, well, you know, a lot of uh, explanation in biology is historical explanation. And uh, so I don't think that comes out in a, in a regression line. But, uh, you know, uh, one of the things we see is, again, social, co social complexity. Um, in tropical birds, you're much more likely to have pairs that, that endure for the whole year, right, and resident on a territory. That kind of long-term social relationship will support duetting. Um, um, Is it the migratory so, birds that have lost duetting? Yeah, well, most, most of the birds that are, that, 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 that are well, uh, duetting is still highly concentrated in just a few groups, uh, songbirds and uh, and, um, you know, uh, a few, and a few other lineages. So there's a lot of things like gulls and, and penguins and shorebirds that don't, uh, that don't have uh, duetting per se. But if you were um, carving up, how, how much of this universe of duetting is explained by historical persistence and path dependence as opposed to theory, what would your proportions be? 
Uh, I don't know. Uh, but I'd have to say, you know, a, a large amount of it, 30 percent, 50 percent is his, is history because a lot of these groups originate like Australian birds. I, I, one, one of the interesting things, all of songbirds are out of Australia, right? They, they, they persisted there for a very long time. So there are a lot of lineages with lots of female song and some duetting and complexity in Australia. And then a few, very few lineages that came out of Australia. And that kind of... Uh, um, uh, long history in a place means that uh, you know you, you're likely to keep uh, something like that, or not, or not have the opportunity or reason to change it. Putting path dependence aside, if you were trying to give us the most fundamental explanation of why sexual dimorphism is different in birds compared to mammals, what would that be? Hmm. Well, uh, that's a, actually a really big. <laughs> <laughs> a really big question. Of course. Uh, well, but you know, the most got, fundamental uh, factor. Uh, what is it? Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the 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 most fundamental factor is that uh, most birds don't have a penis. And walk, talk me through the equilibrium there. <laughs> well, well, there's a lot. There's a lot there. So, so that's where we start. Most birds don't have a penis, which means that one of the things that happens in avian evolution. Um, that's distinct from, from mammals is that the kids require a lot of care, but they also have to, they're growing up in the nest, right? They're hatching out of egg, and, but they're very, very vulnerable until they can fly. So, so birds have a very rapid period of, of uh, rapid development. And that means that they grow up and leave eggs. And you need two parents to do that efficiently in most diets or most kind of ecologies. That means the dad's got to be at the nest, Right, and so we usually thought that um, uh, that female birds are are um, uh, or, or that we, we usually thought that the, that you have you know social monogamy, at least two birds helping raise the young, because uh, the young are so needy and they you know have to grow up quickly. But there's another possibility, which is that uh, they could evolve to be. Uh, so needy and grow up quickly because they managed to get males at the nest. And one of the things that happened, in, you know, in the in the phylogeny of birds, you've got, uh, uh, um, um, you know, ostriches and their relatives, and you got chickens and ducks, and then you got the rest of birds. And that's a that's a bunch. That's you know the vast majority of them. And that in that lineage, the, leading to the rest of birds, the penis uh, uh, evolved away. And the question is why. And my own theory is that female birds. Uh, preferred mates that did not have a penis. Uh, and one of the ancillary benefits of that, one of the correlated benefits of that, is that they were no longer subject to sexual coercion. Uh, they could be, or sexual uh, violence. They could be coerced behaviorally, but they couldn't be forcibly fertilized. And that means that they have freedom of choice. And with the, what do they do with their freedom of choice? They choose beauty. And um, so one of the reasons why birds are so beautiful uh, is that uh, males don't have a penis. So they have to be subject to choice in order to affect uh, reproduction. And also they have to invest uh, if females uh, require it. Now, sometimes albatrosses don't breed until they're 20 years old or even on average, maybe it's what, 10 years old? What are they doing in the meantime that's so important? Yeah, well, that is a deep question. I actually have a student working on uh, delayed maturation. What are they getting better at, uh, right? Because life history theory tells you that you could never, there's no upside to delaying uh, reproduction for uh, if all things are equal, but uh, they must be getting better at something. And a lot of people think it's foraging, right? That they that um, uh, raising that one young on an island, you know, and foraging, uh, you know, hundreds of miles out of the ocean, then returning, and this the whole social relationship uh, to raise a, 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 an albatross family is is tough. Uh, and so uh, being efficient at uh, uh, efficient enough to raise it may take years to 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 develop. Uh, you got to get good at foraging before you can raise a baby, and uh, certain diets certainly require that. And we have the same thing in, in many gulls, large gulls. So it could be a, 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 that they're getting better at at uh, at foraging. Now, one thing I like about ornithology is it has a lot of game theory, just like economics does. So sometimes when I read it, it feels very familiar. So let me ask you whether you all have the same problem that we do. With economic theories of signaling, once you get past the very simplest model, typically there are so many multiple equilibria 
that theories are hard to test, they can predict all kinds of things, and you don't know what to do next. Now, does ornithology have the same problem with signaling, an extreme of multiple equilibria? Yeah, I, well, I, I think so. The question is, is that a bug or is that a feature? Uh, because nature really does look diverse. So the idea that there could be multiple equilibria is not a problem for us, um, or at least for me. Uh, and also, as you can tell from a lot of my answers, I'm really interested in, in, uh, in, in history itself as, uh, as uh, you know, interesting explanatory powers. Um, th the other feature, though, is that um, most of my colleagues, many of my colleagues in evolutionary biology uh, have bought the economic line that communication is about efficient exchange of information. But there's a lot of things we communicate about that, 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 that isn't about uh, information, right? And, and, and that's been a lot of my work has been on, on ornament and, and sexual display, right? And, the, you know, the popular idea is that beauty and the sexual attraction in, in birds and in nature in general is a kind of uh, efficient way to communicate actionable information about mate quality. But the other possibility is that it's merely beautiful. Uh, and, and that's, you know, that it is uh, an irrationally exuberant market bubble in a genetic mating market, right? And, uh, and, that, uh, and that they're off the ranch. So I am really fascinated by those kinds of communication that are about um, suasion and not about, um, not about uh, information, right? And, uh, and so th um, there are some contexts where, of course, you know the, that that uh, the signaling uh, signaling theory is is, is is it applies well, but there are plenty of others where 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 it doesn't. Here's part of what bugs me. So as an economist, I see multiple equilibria, whether I like them or not, I, I feel comfortable with it, right? So you've stressed in your work there's a certain arbitrariness to a lot of aesthetic values in birds and indeed elsewhere. But if you just look commonsensically at a lot of animals, including birds, including humans. It seems that markers of health and fitness and vigor are strongly correlated with sexual attraction, and that's not arbitrary. So we have these models with a lot of multiple equilibria, and then we have our common sense, which says go to the gym to get a date in sure, birds also. How does that all fit together? Doesn't yeah, that mean well, it's uh, not uh, arbitrary? Uh, 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 well, you know, the inter interesting thing is that, that, that I think you have there, you have uh, multiple ways to predict that, that outcome. One, for example, um, is that, um, um, well, let's, uh, it, it, uh, I'm going to take an aesthetic uh, example, right? And uh, for example, you, if you say you went to uh, the symphony and there was a violin concerto, or if you prefer uh, uh, a blues concert or even a rap, uh, <laughs> a rap, rap concert, right? And in the middle of the cadenza or the solo or the, 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 the biggest thing, the, the performer begins to break out into sweat, right? They're really exerting themselves. And the question is this, uh, do we like the music because they're sweating? Or do they have to sweat in order to make the musical performance that the audience likes? And both of those are equal, but the, the uh, most people would say that this is an indicator of quality because they're pushed to motor limits. But aesthetic processes are going to do the same, right? We don't like the ballet because um, many uh, amazing uh, artists and athletes are injured in the process of producing the ballet. We like it because of the aesthetic impact of the ballet. And, and so um, there are other hypotheses for why uh, traits are extreme and may be uh, at the limits, uh, performance limits or health limits of, 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 of those, those individuals. So um, um, how do we differentiate between those two? Well, I spent a lot of time thinking about that. And um, uh, I think that the special hypothesis, the one that demands specific evidence, is that the correlation is actually a result of the uh, relation between the signal and some other kind of benefit other than the... Uh, the, the, uh, the benefit of beauty. But. Now, I, I have cardinals and blue jays in my backyard. I enjoy them greatly. I like their colors. If bird aesthetics are arbitrary to the mating processes of birds, why do I also find it beautiful? Isn't well, that, that a funny is, coincidence? That, 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 that is deeply cool. I think, I, I, I think that's because, uh, you know, humans are intelligent and we have um, 
uh, uh, time on our hands and 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 uh, uh, excess cognition and curiosity to burn, <laughs> and uh, that leads us to 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 become uh, fascinated by nature. Um, but you know, interspecific uh, aesthetic regard is is a fascinating thing. I mean, uh, in the case of color and the case of song. Um, it's explicable in some ways because at least some of this is physics, right? We, we, there is an inherent wavelength relationship uh, between various color combinations. Um, the same for um, acoustics, right? Which we can imagine the, the harmonic relationships between notes in a bird song, just like we could analyze a piece of music. But the real fundamental mystery is why do flowers smell beautiful? And and that one does not have, uh, at least immediately, uh, 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 you know, appealing answers. Uh, because, uh, yeah, it, it turns out there are no uh, receptor genes in common between a bee uh, and a human. Uh, and they're responding to the same flower uh, odors in a similar way. I don't think it's, it's because the olfactory space is just you know, filled with all sorts of other things, and that's where they're left, and, and we learn about that. I, I, I think they are generally positive. So I think that's a, there are a graduate level um, uh, research questions to be pursued in interspecies of interspecific aesthetic uh, uh, impression. But building on that example, what can avian evolutionary theory learn from how flowers attract pollinators through signals? It seems they use color, they use nectar, they use deceptive mimicry, but it can't be the same kind of Fisherian coevolution. Yet the final result is beautiful. So doesn't that imply it's not Fisherian coevolution that is generating sure. the beauty? Well, certainly, uh, in 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 the w one thing about. Uh, pollinator and, and, and plant interactions, that they're different species, right? For the, from, the, from the pollinator perspective, the pollinator is getting food, um, uh, nectar, and sometimes uh, uh, eating the pollen. But from the plant perspective, the plant is getting uh, animal aid in dispersing their gametes to reproduce with other plants, right? So what is the, what is the plant doing? The plant is investing in, 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 in another animal. In order to do that, it has to advertise its opportunity. Right, so this is really in the realm of advertising. And so what the flower really has to be is memorably rewarding, right? And so to me, that's like going into the grocery store and you look at a Coke can or a box of cereal and there's literally nothing on the can or on the box that will tell you anything about what the experience of eating or interacting with that product will be like. And that's exactly what flowers are like, right? And so there's a whole realm of this field uh, in, in biology trying to emphasize coevolution that particular flowers and particular uh, uh, pollinators interact. And of course, those do occur, but the vast majority you know, of flowers are, are pollinated by generalists, and the last, vast majority of pollinators are generalist pollinators, right? So they have to be memorably rewarding. So some of them are like uh, Doritos. You know, you'll reach over and you grab one, but it's not really uh, what you need. And then some products uh, you'll go further for uh, because they're really, really rewarding. Uh, but, um, and this implies actually that bees are making choices. And if bees were not making choices, then the world wouldn't be full of beautiful flowers, right? All the flowers would be exploiting that one button that was the most efficient way to get that bee just to show up and feed. But of course, all the flowers would come to look like each other, and then they wouldn't be carrying their pollen to another one of their same species. So the whole thing would fail, right? So bees are making choices, and they're making aesthetic choices based on the memorably rewarding experience of visiting a flower. Of course, for a bee, a flower is like architecture plus olfaction, uh, plus, you know, this, and actually electro, electric. It turns out um, hummingbirds and, 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 and insects uh, establish a, 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 um, a static charge as they fly. And so as they approach the flower, it's like, you know, when you have rub a balloon on your hair, you, feel, you can feel the balloon getting near your hair, your hair starts to stand up or whatever. They, as they approach the flower, they can actually experience this electric charge. The hairs on their body stand up. And so they can tell. And of course, when the bee forages at the flower, the, uh, the, the charge is neutralized, right? So they can, they can tell whether the flower, how recently that flower has been visited before they even get there by 
the, uh, the static uh, force acting on their hairs. This is a, a subjective experience that, that really influences their choices in the world. So um, what does that have to do with bird breeding, your question? Well, it has to do with the fact that we put the subjective experience of the animal at the center of our analysis. And, and, uh, and indeed, uh, that leads, I think, to uh, you know, really accurate uh, understanding of what's going on in nature. Now, you mentioned Fisher. We didn't talk about that, but what is a Fisherian process? A Fisherian process is a self-organizing, uh, 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 um, um, you know, sexual selection uh, mechanism where genes for preference, liking long or short tails, become correlated with genes for the trait, having a short tail or having a long tail, right? Individuals who like long tails are gonna find mates with them, and even like short tails are gonna find mates with those. So those two forms of variation will start to co-vary, and that means when you select, when an individual selects on a mate, they're also indirectly selecting on co-varying or correlated genetic variation for preference. So that means the whole thing can just run itself, uh, and of course it does, and produces a lot of, a, a lot of diversity. Before we move on, let me put in a plug for your excellent and award-winning book, The Evolution of Beauty. Now let's go to birding. Let's say you're a birder with a collecting mentality. Should it count if you only hear the bird, like a nightingale in a thicket? Well, you know, it definitely counts. The question is, what does it count for? <laughs> right? And, and I am one of those birders, uh, you know, and, and moving from animal subjectivity to birder subjectivity right? Uh, bird watching is, I mean, what the list really is about is, is accounting for your subjective experience of the bird, right? It doesn't just matter that there's that bird in that tree. What matters is, did you see it or did you hear it, uh, right? And, and uh, that's your, your experience of it. And um, uh, hearing a bird, it, 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 for some birds, is more spectacular than seeing them, obviously. Uh, but yes, but people do uh, make different sorts of lists, and uh, typically for what's called one's life list, uh, people really want to see the bird. Uh, you know, have I ever seen the bird? And then, but if it's for a, a, a more minor list, your day list, your state list, or um, uh, actually, data points. Then hearing it is just as good as seeing it if it's uh, for the for the for the purposes of data, right? Now, ammeters have so much ready access to technology: iPhones, AirPods, so much more. How is this shaping the evolution of bird watching? Oh my gosh, it's it, it revolutionized it. Uh, there are uh, two programs produced by the uh, the Lab of Ornithology at Cornell University that have really transformed birding. One is called eBird. Uh, right where you can keep live checklists, you can uh, on your phone as you go. Uh, that's um, and then the other is Merlin, which will actually identify photographs using artificial intelligence of birds. So they take a photograph of a bird and load it up, and it'll tell you what it is. Uh, with uh, for most parts of the world, with uh, you know incredible accuracy for common birds, and uh, and really quite uh, a, a, a elaborate ability for for even obscure birds. Um, what you have to say now is, in addition to an electronic camera, uh, young folks today are birding with their phones. Uh, their data are going up to the cloud in real time and influencing what other bird watchers are doing and, uh, and becoming the subject of, uh, of science through uh, sort of citizen science. So it's really been a huge revolution. So birding in this sense is a bit like chess, a quite unlikely winner from the rise of the internet and technology, but exploding well, in popularity? I. I I don't know. I, I mean, I guess my fingers aren't quite enough on the pulse. Uh, uh, I, uh, you know, we went through a long time because as a kid, I, I grew up uh, birding. I started at the age of 10. And for me, it was all about going outside. It's like, uh, you know, I'm going out after school. <laughs> the screen door slams and there you go. You're off outside. And, uh, uh, and I, you know, have been concerned for a long time about whether the way children are raised in the you know modern world that not enough of that is happening uh if people get back outside through their phones i think that's great uh but uh but it does it it is it is uh it is uh it still i'm i'm old school you know i i i uh uh, I'm not keeping my checklist uh, <laughs> during the day, right, as we go. Of course, my, that means my data aren't, aren't probably as high quality either. So, uh, but, uh, uh, um, but I think some people are. 
What's the I, most I important bird missing from your personal checklist? And hearing oh, well, it doesn't yeah. count. You've already told <laughs> us. <laughs> you know, well, it, uh, there's lots of different measures, but you know, sometimes you, it, it's all, it's all. There's, there's no rationality to it, right? For, uh, for, uh, I once t took a trip up to, uh, well, about five, six years ago, I took a trip up to northern Norway to see um, Stellar's eider, a, a duck that. Uh, if you imagine, you know, between Norway and Alaska, right, what is there? <laughs> way, way up there. They, you know, that's where they nest. And in the, in the winter, they only barely come down to Norway or Alaska. Uh, and uh, so I wanted to see them. And I got up there. Uh, and a date of, you know, 10 years ago, I would have seen, on that date, I would have seen 1,000. Five years before, I would have seen 100. And by the time I got there, climate change was happening so rapidly in the Arctic that I got there, and there were none to be seen on that date, right? And so I've been really desperate to see Stellar Zider just because, right? <laughs> it's because you take a notion, uh, and, and uh, that's the beautiful thing. I would love, what I really love would be, like, what's, uh, you know, because uh, the history of life is a tree. I've been very interested in the phylogeny birds, you know, who's related to whom, the big tree of life and the tree of birds. And you can say, well, I've seen these and these species, but I haven't seen these. What's the species most unrelated to any species I've seen that I could? <laughs> what would be the species that would give me the most, the best addition to my total sample of avian diversity? Right? Amoa. That's, uh, well, <laughs> I mean, yeah, well yeah, 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 exactly. Well, you know, the, the, the answer right off the bat for most people would probably be the Hoatzin. And the Hoatzin is a very weird vegetarian or leaf-eating uh, Amazonian bird. And uh, the bird probably most unrelated to any other living bird. Uh, after that, it gets a, a lot of specific things to, you know, what you've seen. But uh, um, yeah, the, the, the next trip you're planning, those are the most important birds to see. It seems there's been a lot of big advances on the research side lately. So there's cheap tagging, much easier, radio telemetry, applying machine learning to birdsong. Uh, what's the most important thing going to come out of all these very new advances? Well, uh, that, you've only just begun to skim the, skim the surface. I mean, um, I used to think, and I'll, I'll say this proudly, just to embarrass myself. Uh, I, I used to I used to think that the chicken genome was the most uninteresting thing I could ever imagine, right? And it turns out, you know, genomics has really <laughs> been fantastically revealing for features we ultimately want to know about, like uh, uh, you know, the funny features that characterize birds. So uh, transcriptomes, uh, taking a tissue and sequencing all of the RNA that's being expressed at the moment, getting a an idea of what uh, expression states are in different kinds of cells uh, on up. Um, uh, on, on, on your tagging technology, that's been fantastic. The Max Planck Institute for uh, Animal Movement in Germany has uh, put up uh, Icarus, a big satellite that is uh, uh, capturing uh, in real time data on animal movement and uh, individual animals. Uh, so they're getting basically the whole entire movement of, uh, of a life of a wild animal. And you get enough of those, and sure enough, you, you get a very new view of what's going on uh, in, in the world. You know, the interesting thing about progress is you never know what it's gonna turn up, right? I mean, uh, and that's where the, the opportunities are, but you know, figure out what's the best way to, to use that technology to answer uh, uh, or, or, or address a cool issue in, in birds. What's your favorite word for a group of birds? Is it a covey of quails, an unkindness of ravens, a parliament of owls? Which one? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I think my favorite, my favorite uh, word for a group of birds would be the genus. <laughs> a, that, a different group, a, a historical group. Should we use bird feeders in our backyards? I think so. I, I love my bird feeders, and, um, and I, I really enjoy them. Um, and I think that there are some downsides, uh, um, you know, in particular being sites of potential infection for uh, diseases that are, that are moving through. Um, uh, they're the opposite of, 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 of social distancing, right? They're social concentrating. So they can't they can be uh, centers for uh, conjunctivitis-like uh, illnesses in, in finches recently in the United States, et cetera. But, do they just worsen the Malthusian equilibrium? And how well does the Malthusian subsistence theory predict bird populations? Like are birds well, at the margin of subsistence <laughs> as a whole? Well, you know, uh, uh, you know, one of the things one of the things that Malthus did take into account was like, uh, you know, uh, um, 
or much account into was, uh, you know, variability, right? The fact that, uh, uh, you know, an ice storm, for example, birds, a lot of birds in the winter, if we think about bird, birds at your feeder, um, they can do fine at 10, minus 5, minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 20, you know, if you get the chickadees, right, if they have enough food. But if they don't have access to food, they will die in a single night, right? And, and so these ice storms, which could be, you know, just 32 degrees, covering all the food, the whole environment with ice for a day, uh, can be just devastating for uh, lots of lots of birds. If there weren't feeders, they would they would they, 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 their pipers would really harm harm things like Carolina wren, which is a bird that's kind of expanding. And I, I think a, a big ice storm will set down Carolina wren populations at the edge of the range in in New England or the Mid Atlantic uh, for uh, you know five years. It'll take them to to rebound after that. Do we have good theories of bird property rights, somehow invoking the ideas of relative scarcities to explain when birds are territorial, are not territorial, or is that just a big mess that we don't understand? No, there there are some there are some there's some uh, I think uh, good things. So, so if you're uh, um, if you're say an aerial insectivore, you're f- f- you know catching insects in the air, uh, you'll be territorial if you catch insects uh, fr- uh, like, you know, that are 15 inches away from a branch, right? Just, whoop, you know, going out for a little sally. You can defend all those branches. That's my territory. But if you're a swift or a swallow and you're, you're, you're flying hundreds of meters or hundreds of feet up in the air and all of it, you know, it's very hard to defend that, right? Uh, so, so you give it up, right? Um, it, it, you know, uh, lots of marsh birds, uh, marshes are very rich, lots of bugs. So if you can grab your patch of lily pads or, 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 or bull rushes or cattails, you can really do well. You want to defend that. But, you know, if you're a puddle duck, there's going to be lots of water in there. The things, you know, somewhere, you know, 18 inches below the surface of the water, uh, you can't really defend that. And so, so uh, uh, for the most part, you know, uh, so, so very with your body, your ecology, et cetera. Um, you know, uh, uh, and we can do experiments. So, for example, sometimes hummingbirds will defend a floral resource, and then when it gets big enough, they'll just give it up because there's no reason to do it anymore. Now, in all of these conversations, we have a segment in the middle called Underrated versus Overrated. I <laughs> toss out a name, an idea, a place. You tell me if you think it's underrated or overrated. <laughs> Got it? Okay. I, I, I'm not sure we have this. We, we, we'll, we'll, uh, it could be a combination of Rorschach test too because what do we think of the thing that's named but yeah go for it we'll go for it roger mcguinn uh i don't know who that is i thought you were an expert about the birds here's an easier one larry bird <laughs> larry bird larry bird is is uh perfectly rated <laughs> he uh... the bird song music of messian the french composer oh well I, you know i think uh, way underrated I, I i love that stuff charlie parker um, and what's your favorite I, cut by him? <laughs> well, I, you know, I know it when I hear it, but I don't, you know, and I actually have albums where I know which cut is which, but I don't know. I actually haven't looked at the liner notes and not enough to know. It has to the, be ornithology, the, right? Yeah, yes. Well, yeah. yeah. But, uh, um, uh, yeah. The Alfred Hitchcock. Underrated. The Alfred Hitchcock movie, The Birds. Overrated. Why? You yeah, know, I mean, uh, I think that's a lot of damage to be afraid of nature, right? And, uh, you know, and, and I think, um, I know people that are bird phobic, and I'm not sure whether, you know, uh, whether it arises from that, from something like that movie. So, yeah. Is the diversity of the protagonists in the birds a kind of portent? Does that make it more terrifying? <laughs> or just, just, the, just the, uh, the sinister turn that all of nature is out, is out to get us, you know? Uh, I, I mean, I, I think I, 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 when I saw it, uh, you know, in, uh, maybe it is black and white. I th- saw it in TV in black and white as a kid. I just crossed my arms and, ah, I don't know. <laughs> I've never seen it since. <laughs> John James Audubon as an artist, overrated or underrated? I think, I think we're still underrating what he achieved. Who is your favorite bird artist? Is it him? Uh, 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 an artist, no, George Mish Sutton, George Sutton, who is a, an American watercolorist of American birds, fantastic, fantastic uh, uh, renditions of birds. He really, he really uh, was amazing at, at uh, both the art and the ornithology. Putting aside birds, travel in Suriname. Should yeah. I go? <laughs> 
Well, I haven't been in more than a decade, so but you should definitely go. It's a marvelous part of the world. I think it's on hard times uh, in, 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 in recent decades. Beautiful, beautiful people and, uh, and marvelous avifauna. Let's say a, a good friend comes to you who has reasonable income, well-educated, but not an ornithologist, not even a birder, but interested. And this person says, I have a month of my life and I want to go around the world, I can go anywhere feasible, and look at birds. What is the perfect tour for that person? <laughs> You're in charge. Where do you send them? <laughs> oh, that, that's fascinating. You know, um, I think one of the things that it can impress uh, uh, a person without, without the experience to understand that the hard work is, is worthwhile or will be worthwhile is, is spectacle. Right, and and so things like uh, you know penguin colonies in in the Antarctic are, are just you know profoundly uh, amazing, and uh, so 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 that would definitely be a possibility. Um, other kinds of ornithological spectacle depends how how young they were. Some people, you know, let's say they're forty, like, so they're they're okay. able bodied. Well, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, but they're well, not a know, rock they, climber. Do you send them to yeah. Colombia, to Panama? <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, but the problem the problem with some of those places is, of course, is that the bird watching is hard. It really is hard work, right? And I know I've taken students who know little. Well, they've they had half of my ornithology course taken them to Ecuador, and and you know sh we've seen hundred you know four hundred and ninety species of birds in in ten days, and uh, uh, usually <laughs> their bra their brains are fried, right? <laughs> And we just, you know, we, 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 you know, it's a, it's a lot, it's a lot of work. And, uh, uh, so, 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 but I think you need to be over a little hump before you, before you do that. Uh, so, uh, spectacle would be good. So, um, another thing, one thing I did that was last, uh, uh, in, in 2018 in Brazil, um, I went to see, um, a, a, a nesting site, a nesting colony of Spix's macaw. This is, a a very, um, um, oh, sorry, Lear's macaw. Fix's macaw is the one that's in the extinct. Lear's macaw. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a uh, sort of aqua green, aqua bluish green turquoise uh, 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 parrot, and it nests in a cliff face with uh, uh, where there are holes, and uh, they come out of this cliff face in the dawn. It's kind of a a huge cliff with a kind of cavern in front of you, and they fly around. And it's just it was unbelievably moving. It's unbelievably uh, 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 beautiful. And these are intelligent birds that live for decades, know each other as individuals, and unfortunately critically endangered, but being well conserved at this site. So uh, there are a number of things like that. Uh, you know, an oil bird cave is an number incredible thing for the right person. These are nocturnal frugivores. They live in caves in South America and Andes, and they fly out of the cave at night and fly uh, dozens or even hundreds of miles out to forage on avocado and palm fruits that they bring back to the cave and feed to their babies. And they're called oil birds because they used to capture them and render them down for oil and cook with it and you know uh, make candles out of it. Uh, that's how fatty they are you know, from the avocado oil. But going to an oil bird cave is amazing. And often you have, a, deep in the cave, you'll see a, a, a forest of ideolated seedlings, all white, they, no photosynthesis. They've, they've, they've uh, 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 started to propagate in the guano, and the guano will have uh, look like guacamole green because that's what they're actually eating, <laughs> avocados. <laughs> so it, it's a, it, you know, sort of the edges of ornithological experience. So for the right person, th th some things like that could really be, uh, really be the, 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 the best. Why is it that birds such as falcons and cormorants hunt and fish with us? How did that happen? Mm, uh, you know, domestication is a cool thing. It's like where well, people intercede with nature and uh, and somehow co-opt the but somehow, biology. I, I want to know the somehow. Is it that they're smart enough to figure out gains from trade? Has it become instinct? Um, I think it's that uh, mostly that will... You get them. You get the animal while it's young. So in traditionally falconry, you would get the bird on southern migration and capture it, 
uh, you could tell it was naive. It could, you could fool it easier, so it's easier to capture. And then you'd, uh, you know, you either hold it for a year or over the winter, or and, and then let it go, or and then later you you kept with it. You know, they haven't become a domesticated str- strain, if you will, like a chicken or a dog. Um, um, but you're 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 co-opting the capacity. It's like having a pet parrot, right? The parrot thinks it's a human, and uh, the way it develops in this new environment with human social partners is is extraordinary and different. And uh, so that, that's how that's how that uh, how, how that works. Um, the fishing in the cormorants, I, I, I don't know if it's still going on. It was a tradition in, 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 in areas of Japan, I know, but I, I, I've never uh, witnessed it or, or, or seen it happen. I think that those birds are captured from the wild. They don't breed them, I don't believe. Here's a question from a reader, and I quote, Osprey, they hatch early July, are flying by the last week of August. The adults leave around September 15th, heading south, and the young ones hang around for a couple of weeks, bulking up on the late landlocked salmon spawns, then head south, end quote. How exactly do they know where to go? How exactly <laughs> does this bird instinct work? This is great. We, 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 and this is actually an area uh, where we're learning a lot because of new technology. So now we have these uh, 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 GPS transmitters that you can get uh, uh, satellite information in real time on where those birds are. And this is the work, I, mostly I believe, of uh, Rob Beauregard, who has done this in ospreys. So, uh, and most ospreys spend the winter in a very narrow area, area of the Llanos of Venezuela and Colombia. <laughs> That's where the ospreys go, or at least in this continent. Uh, and so um, what the young ospreys do is they fly off the East Coast kind of wandering around in the ocean. Sometimes they hit Bermuda. Sometimes they, you know, wander. They might return to North South Carolina. And then they, they, they basically mess it up. And somehow or other, eventually they get down to the Antilles and they realize, oh, and they follow the chain of the Lesser Antilles down to South America. And then on the way north, they realize, oh, we've got the Guajira Peninsula, you know, in, 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 uh, in northern Colombia. And then we pass over. We, oh, we get to Jamaica. And then, we, and then they go, boom, and they return up through Florida to these. And then what do they do next year? They go down to Florida, jump over to Cuba, come down the islands. So it's a combination. So what do birds need to, to migrate? They need to have uh, a, uh, a magnetic uh, a compass. Uh, they also have a... Uh, a sun compass. They have to have a, a clock and an experience of the sun. Uh, and they have to know kind of, they need a map w- about which we don't know much. Um, and then they have to have a, a bearing, like where they're going, and then a sense of how far to go or, or from a map, uh, whether they've reached their destination. And then once they, uh, in, in, in real life, uh, they experience the world and then refine that with experience. So they have some innate uh, properties or capacities and then uh, a lot of experience. So, and, of course, a lot of them, uh, uh, you know, fail to learn. And, uh, you know, I'm sure some of those birds that wander out in the ocean, you know, fail. Uh, How much is there a generalized G factor for the intelligence of birds? So, for uh, instance, oh, if they're good at uh, using... what dual- factor? Pardon? Well, for humans, we would call it a G factor. So if you're smart at one thing, you tend to be smart at another. Uh, how much if a bird is, say, good at using tools or good at playing, is the bird just smart flat out? Or are birds highly specialized in their smartness? They're really smart at one thing and then very stupid at another. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think, I think that um, uh, there are lots of examples of extraordinarily specific smartness in birds that doesn't apply. But the birds that are really smart tend to be smart at a lot of stuff. So, so, so there's a few of them that stand out with breadth of smart. And I'm thinking parrots and crows, uh, corvids and, and parrots. They're, they're, they're the most notable. They stand out above, of, above everybody else. And indeed, you know, now if you look at the, uh, the, the pallial neurons, which are basically the ones with the smart connections, uh, a, a parrot will have more pallial neurons than, than a monkey with a brain that's four or five times as large. Right. So they really are, uh, they've gone a different route in their organization of cognitive complexity, and they're they're really doing it really efficiently. Um, But there are all sorts of extraordinary intelligences that are that are very, very specific in in, in birds, I think. And uh, and um, uh, that, that, that don't have that property. Do you think ravens and crows understand death? 
Oh, wow. I don't know. I have, I, you know. A lot uh, of birds go crazy when they see other dead birds, right? They make a lot of noise. Doesn't mean they understand death, but they know something's no, gone wrong. No, no, uh, no. Uh, but I, I do think there are examples of birds. Carl Safina has, has, has cataloged these, and I, don't, uh, and I don't know that literature. But there are certainly examples of birds uh, that appear to be mourning or understanding that their that their compatriots are 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 uh, physically present but not, not no longer living, right? Whatever that is, um, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they do, right? I mean, they know each other as individuals uh, deeply and uh, appreciate it. And they, you know, we were, you were mentioning albatross earlier. One of the things about albatross, the big ones, they nest every other year. So at every albatross colony, there's an even year cohort and an odd year cohort that returns and they they take off the other year then come back to reproduce and and they are monogamous over decades if they live long enough right and so they'll spend that year off nine and a half months or 12 15 months whatever it is and they'll even fly around the entire south south southern continents around antarctica a couple times then return uh to the farallon or malvinas islands and then meet that same mate and then mate again Right, and uh, they recognize each other, and so those kinds of uh, of uh, of uh, um, they, I certainly think they would understand that that bird is not not returning. And birds have culture, right? Absolutely. About half the birds of the world, uh, just uh, for one example of culture, half the birds of the world uh, learn their songs from other members of their species. Almost always, not their parents. And what that means is you got a decoupling from uh, genetic variation and the phenotype or the, the presentation of the animal. So uh, what do they do? They, they learn from other individuals and uh, they learn preferences. So the birds in uh, the areas around Chicago, New York, and Boston sound differently, uh, just like the people do, and for pretty much the exact same reason, right? And it's not because of the, 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 uh, the wind in Chicago or the baked beans in Boston, right? It's, 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 uh, it's isolation by distance and historical contingency and, and cultural change. So birds have been doing culture for tens of millions of years, which you know puts us to shame, uh, certainly in, in in terms of diversity. Of course, we piled a lot of culture uh, on our one little invention, and uh, and that's uh, notable and and uh, and uh, interesting in its own right too. Will puffins perish? Wow, you know, the oceans are getting deeply screwed up. Uh, and climate change, both of these combinations are really uh, affecting the Arctic or northern... Comp I don't think the puffins will go extinct um, on the, you know, a couple century scale, but, uh, but um, uh, their distributions and lives are really going to change, I think. Should we try to find the DNA of passenger pigeons and bring them back? You know... Um, I find this rewilding business to be, uh, or revivification, <laughs> uh, to be really uh, off-putting. Um, however, and but mostly why? because, I, well, mostly because, mostly because, I mean, the reason why it went extinct is that it needed continental scale, uh, you know, richness of, you know, chestnut and oak forests in order to survive. And there's just no place in the world where that is, right? They, they, they're extraordinarily social. Uh, they only laid one egg, right, a year, which means that they were very, they were at, uh, what we call, uh, you know, K-selected, you know, there was a, they were, they, and, and so as a result, um, you know, there's very, almost no place uh, for them in the world. Uh, uh, having said that, most of my criticism are also um, framed by the unrealism of the technology, just like, okay, so we find a few genes, and we put them into uh, bantail pigeon, the sister group, the, sister, the closest extant species, and we put them in, and we kind of make it a little bit more like a passenger pigeon. Wouldn't that be cool? It's like, well, no, that's not really cool. Uh, but it, I mean, if we really had the technology to really bring back passenger pigeons, I'd give it, I, sure, I'd be into that. But uh, we, we're very, very far from that. What's the best overall framework for thinking about the actual value of avian biodiversity when we face real trade-offs? Say, are we going to put in more wind power, right? So it's going to kill some birds but it might help with climate change. How, how do we even begin to approach a question like that? Yeah, yeah. Do we ask yeah, the well, economists? You're not I, gonna I, ask I, me, I, right? I had, 
You know, I had, I had uh, actually, I had a, uh, I'm just grading term papers right now in ornithology, and I had a term paper in ornithology exactly on this question. That was pretty good, you know, by, uh, by a, uh, a, a, a political science student with interest in, in, uh, in environmental uh, policy. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know if I've got the training to, to say that, except to, to understand that, yeah, it's a, it is real trade-offs. I, I think we're making them all, all the time. Uh, I think in general, w it, it, I mean, if there were enlightened policy, like, you know, carbon tax, uh, et cetera, e even a little bit of it, uh, you know, we'd be in much better situation to see, see where, you know, you know, maybe it would solve itself. Uh, but you know, there's certainly a lot of uh, a lot of reason for concern. There's also a lot of interesting resilience, right? We're looking in New England here, where I live. You know, uh, we used to have uh, chestnut trees, and they disappeared. And we used to have elm trees, and they basically became irrelevant, right? And now we're looking at hemlocks disappearing because of the woolly adelgid. And now, you know. Uh, Ashes, uh, the emerald ash borer from China has arrived, and you know, so we're we're losing major trees, and yet yet they still seem to have forests. We still have a lot of you know uh, some birds in them. Now there are less birds, fewer birds. That's true, but um, there seem to be not as much uh, some kind of resilience uh, despite this change. But yeah, you know, I don't know. I wish I had a better answer, but that's that's that that's um, um, I'm still a historian rather than a a, a predictor. Uh, in, in my work. Is one billion too many sparrows? <laughs> no. Is it wrong to own a cat that you let outside? Yes. Just flat out wrong? Yeah. But if we don't know how to make the trade-offs, how do we know it's wrong? Well, because, I mean, it, it, uh, that is really, really clear. Uh, I mean, it, you you have uh, concocted, created an artificial predator that you're, that you're keeping uh, really happy and healthy and feeding it and uh, uh, you know, keeping it in a peak condition so that you can have it go outside and, and, uh, and entertain itself. And its entertainment is damaging to the world. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the scale of cat death, I don't know the numbers, but that, you know, way more uh, uh, birds are killed by cats than are killed by all the wind power in, in, in America. It's just, it, it, it's, it's devastating. It's billions of birds. I read an estimate recently, it did not seem to be scientifically serious, but it suggested that a billion birds die each year just by crashing into human things. Is that yeah. plausible that the number is that high? Sure. Uh, but, but I'll tell you that uh, the, the, the data for cats is way bigger than that. So cats, uh, you know, kill more birds than all the skyscrapers and, uh, and windmills. Uh, and these are, you know, pets. Oh, and also feral cats that are maintained by humans. Very last segment of our chat. It's what I call the Richard Prum production function. How did growing up in rural Vermont help influence who you are professionally and lead to your success? Um, you know, a lot of my science is deeply rooted in natural history, right? I am not interested in law-like properties of nature, but in the uh, idiosyncratic instances and um, a lot of that, that view grew out of bird watching, grew out of my childhood and being interested in birds. And a lot of people do birding and then go into science, right? But, but for me, somehow that, that birding experience uh, affected how I do science. And I think that um, somehow there, uh, you know, I have kind of a, a minority style of mind in, in, in modern science. A lot, of, a lot of great scientists out there, but most of them are not thinking the way I do. And so as a result, there just seem to be more opportunities. What's that difference in how you think? How would you characterize it? And it's most fundamental for I really care about birds. <laughs> 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 I think that birds are really interesting. So I am not necessarily worried about what the other guy, I mean, of course, here's the deal. Uh, you know, my favorite Onion article was, uh, was the, the title, you know, NSF study shows science is hard, <laughs> right? Yeah, science is hard. So what are people's response to that, the fact that science is hard? A lot of people will go and say, well, if I'm going to expend a lot of energy, I better do something that somebody else thinks is important. So what do you think is important? And they and they look to the sides, and they think that that is doing something that somebody else thinks is important is their is their mission. 
right? And I think about the birds and I think, what is the coolest thing that I could do with my time now or this day, this next day ahead of me that would solve some answer? And, and of course, I love to connect that to big science, whether it's like, where do feathers come from? Or how do bluebirds get blue? Areas that I've you know, worked on. Um, and, uh, and, and, and in many cases, they turn out to have uh, you know, uh, deep implications for their field. But, um, but it's that regard for the birds. It's a kind of w what, uh, what uh, Don Haraway calls a situated knowledge, right? It, that you, it's not the voice from uh, nowhere. It's the, the specific instance, the, 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 the view from here. And, and where that here is. So, and I think, you know, I, I recently read a paper in, in a, an esteemed journal called The American Naturalist, right, which is very highly ranked, but has this sort of, uh, you know, sounds like a wildflower a garden club report or something. Anyway, The American Naturalist. And it was, uh, uh, you got 2,000 words into the, into the paper before you realized that it's about house wrens in Ohio. Right now, now you know what it, what is going on there. I think people are embarrassed about the, the the position of their work. They're so interested in the general principles of like, oh, this is a big incisive issue that uh, biologists need to solve, and uh, and that generalized frame is, is leading us often astray to do work that's uninspired or a lot incremental, like everybody else is doing, or. Et cetera. So, so, um, and I mean, maybe that you know, you're 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 pushing me in new ways. Uh, so maybe it's being the only bird watcher uh, that I knew <laughs> under the age of of 25 as a child for a long time um, led me to think, you know, you just got to rely on yourself to figure out what what what's what's of value in in your work. Who first spotted your talent for studying birds? Other than you. <laughs> You know, uh, as a kid, uh, the, uh, um, uh, I interacted with a number of people uh, that were mostly garden club ladies, right? They were my mom's age or older or retired people. They had cars. I did not have a car in fourth grade, fifth grade, right? So uh, it was a great deal. We went, uh, and, uh, and, and they certainly did a great deal to cultivate me. But, uh, so garden read, club uh, ladies are underrated, is what you're telling oh, us. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, that, that's a that's a big that's a big one, uh, and then natural history, their introduction to flowers and ferns and to and to and to another way of being outdoors, which it was actually I related to much better than the Boy Scouts, right? Which which I uh, I left pr pr pretty quickly. Uh, but then uh, I met a, a, a young Yaley, then hippie, uh, hanging out in Southern Brown, a guy named Tom Will, who's uh, now uh, re just recently retired from the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, and and he was a great mentor uh, early on in, in birding. Last question. Other than the obvious, such as intelligence, hard work, how do you recognize a very talented prospective ornithologist? What is it you look for? It's like, you know, it, 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 you just get these responses. And of course, it happens. Uh, luckily, I have uh, had, well, I've had the privilege to teach lots of really f amazing people. Uh, but you're explaining something to somebody, giving them a bit of a context, and then all of a sudden, you know, uh, you get a shot back, you get a response back, and you're like, oh, yeah, they got that. This is the next thing, right? They got that. Oh, and then you get, and then it pitches back, right? That, that interplay where you, you, you link something out, and they see where you're headed and ask you a question, and they often will say, wow, this is a real, I don't know if this is a dumb question, but what about blind? It's like, that's not a dumb question. That's the fundamental focus of <laughs> where this whole field is going. And, and uh, you know, uh, uh, and I've experienced, you know, I used to teach at the University of Kansas, and, uh, and in Kansas, this, uh, you know, it was a big, very huge university, uh, but the great, the great students were, 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 were as good as anywhere. And, and, uh, you know, and then you would have an, a marvelous experience of, of discovering uh, a, a student who was really smart and didn't actually know it. Uh, they might have been the smartest kid in their town in a, you know, coming off the, somewhere in West Kansas, but they had never had an opportunity to experience uh, what they were capable of, right? So uh, uh, it's really that response. Uh, do they, are they coming back at you with, uh, with, uh, with their own thoughts? Richard Prum, thank you very much. And again, a big plug for Richard's book, 
The Evolution of Beauty, How Darwin's Forgotten Theory of Mate Choice Shapes the Animal World and Us. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. That was really fun.